Uh, good evening, everyone. If we can have our panelists uh, share their um, their video, that would be great. We still have families signing in, but I would like to go ahead and get started right away. Um, so let's just see. I'm just letting a couple more people in here. Um, Okay, well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. We have uh, students and parents from all grade levels in the audience tonight. And this webinar will be recorded. Just a little bit of housekeeping. We will definitely save time for Q&A, so feel free to use the chat, and I will be monitoring the chat at the end. Um, but uh, first, I'd like to just say how truly honored we are to have such respected professionals with us tonight to provide an overview of the college admissions experience. I find that parents and students are really looking for factual and current information when it comes to the college process, especially in times of uncertainty, which is why we look forward to these conversations where we can hear directly from uh, people in admissions, especially such highly experienced as uh, the three of you are here tonight. So I'd like to just quickly do some introductions and we'll turn it over to our first panelist. Um, we're uh, very lucky to have Mike Drish, who's the executive director from Vanderbilt here with us. We have Karen Vargas, who is the Dean of Admissions from Wake Forest, and Candace Keith, who is the Director of Admissions from Villanova. And uh, Karen is gonna kick us off this evening and uh, talk to us a little bit about shaping your college list. Uh, and then we'll go on to our other panelists and then open it up for questions after. So if I can turn it over to you, Karen, that would be great. Excellent, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Again, my name is Karen Vargas. I serve as Dean of Admissions at Wake Forest University and I use she, her, and Aya pronouns. I'm excited to spend some time with you all and talk about shaping the college list with your child. Um, I will admit that I am a parent of a current high schooler. And so um, I am sharing these tips, recognizing that I'm also taking a backseat at home. And so when you're thinking about shaping this college list with your child, recognizing that the voice of the parent and the voice of the student are two separate things. And so having those conversations early and often, I think is extremely important. What I think is good for my child may not necessarily be what they think is good for them in that moment. Maybe a larger school versus a public school, maybe closer to home versus further away, um, maybe a religious institution versus a non-religious institution. There are all these factors that you have to take into consideration. So my first point um, and bit of advice is to begin the conversation early and have the conversation often. Um, I'm always a, a, a bit giddy inside when my child will come home from a conversation at school and will say, we were talking about um, Vanderbilt at, at school, someone is is applying this year and we're so excited for them or, um, oh, Wake Forest, you know, it's, it's in our backyard, you know, maybe I'll take a tour when um, this summer when it's not super busy and I know that I'll be able to really take it all in as opposed to um, maybe on a, a busier day, like a, a busy visit day. And so always think about having that conversation early and keeping that conversation alive often. Um, I always encourage parents and students as they're thinking about this process to create a list. Um, I know for, for, for us at home, we have an Excel sheet with lots of different factors. And so um, today they might really think about, you know, athletics, or they might think about a particular club or organization. And then a month from now, that is no longer part of their realm. It's, it's no longer part of their thought process. And that's part of the evolution with our students is that um, they have all these wonderful ideas. And so think about, yes, what today they're excited about, but also what tomorrow may bring as a potential opportunity. I always encourage students as well to think about a broad range of institutions. Um, and so don't necessarily, um, you know, eliminate a school from the list just because they may not offer a major or program. We know that for a lot of students, they come in with an idea and often that changes. And so it's really about college fit. It's really about finding a place for a student to thrive and be their best self. And sometimes um, that's more than just a particular major, a particular location, or a particular um, type of institution. If anything I can offer you this evening, it is to create your list and be amenable throughout the process. If you're developing a list in 10th grade, and that's where my child is right now, versus where they're at maybe in that senior year, 
that list will shift a little bit. It will look very different than when we first started the conversation. And so I fully embrace that. I also recognize that as a parent, what I want isn't necessarily what my child will embrace in the process. And so I see Mike um, chuckling there. And so maybe he can um, share a little bit as well. And I know Candace has a, a child at um, in college, but it's always really wonderful for me to see this evolution and how the conversation progresses. And I recognize that as a Dean of Admissions, my voice and my perspective is one, but I have to I have to pay attention and pay close attention to the needs and thought process of my child. Um, so begin the process early, consider the voice of your child throughout this journey, be open to a broad range of institutions, don't be afraid to craft a list, change the list and change it again one more time before that senior year begins. But most importantly, think about what your, your child is looking for and what they're valuing as part of their own college fit journey and process. I'll leave it there. Okay, thanks, Karen. Um, okay, I think if uh, Mike, you can kick it off a little bit and talk about uh, what factors are really considered in the application process. Absolutely. And I'd like to start by just saying thank you for having us tonight. Thank you for all the families that are taking time out of what is a busy time of the year to hear a little bit more about this process. And hopefully tonight, those either who are here live or will watch the recording will find some great value in this. Um, the only thing I can say is unlike Karen, my oldest is 10. And I'm sure if there are any parents listening, they probably remember 10 feels like probably a minute ago. And here you are. So I have a 10, 8, and 6-year-old. So Pretty soon I will be in the thick of all of this and I'll have to separate myself. So um, we'll see how it all goes. But Karen, I applaud you and Candace, you've been through it. So we, you've got a good, good variety of perspective here. Um, I get to talk a little bit about the factors considered in the admissions process. And I think the, the most important thing to know is the goal of the process is to ensure that you are a good match with our university on both aspects of success and belonging which includes both academic and personal attributes. And we'll talk a little about those. The admissions process is all about our effort in admissions offices to envision you in our campus communities. Because our hope is that you'll bring your background, your perspective, and you'll make our incredible campuses even better. And you will benefit from those already there and those joining you in the class as a part of that first year experience. So that's really our task in admissions. So how do we go about that? When we look at a wide variety of factors, the major factors are things like your academics, your school or community involvement, the personal essays, recommendation letters from counselors or teachers, and then you'll see a mixed bag about things around standardized testing. And so we'll talk a little about that. But kind of starting with the first one, academics are the most critically important piece because our goal is to ensure that you can do the work in our college classroom. And how do we know that? We look at the context of your high school environment. We look at the courses you've taken, the grades you've received, the trends in your achievement, the years of your grades, where were those grades in ninth grade versus 10th grade versus 11th grade, the types of courses where your grades fall, are they AP or honors? Are they more regular courses? And so we really unpack everything about your academics. Gone are the days, especially for highly selective universities, of basing a decision on a GPA or a number alone. It's looking at that trend overall. And so your overall achievement within the context of the specific courses, the progression from 9th to 10th to 11th, and then ultimately looking at courses for 12th grade, but really your grades in those first three years is what we're going to spend a lot of time doing. But Academics alone will not determine whether or not you'll be a good match for our campus. And so we go well beyond your academics and ultimately making a decision. And one of the, the next important factors is your school or community involvement. The thing is, you may have an idea of what matters to you or your school community. All we're focused on is what did you have the option to get involved and active with and what did you choose to do? So if it's clubs, if it's the performing arts, if it's sports, if it's a part-time job, if it's a service organization, maybe it's helping support your family in one way or another, all of those are great ways to spend your free time, as long as you're doing two things. One, you're 
involved and active in a way that is a multi-year commitment, if that was possible. And the second piece is if you're involved and active over a period of time, that you have some demonstrated impact, that you're not just a general member, but you found other ways to make a difference in that club, that performing arts involvement, that sport, whatever it may be, even that job. And so the more you can help us understand how you gave back, how you made an impact, that's the big distinguishing piece of being involved and active. It's not just being a general member, especially at highly selective universities. But what you're involved in, we really don't have much concern or judgment for that as long as it's something that is multi-year and you find a way to give back. Um, as I mentioned, this process is all about getting to know you and you students have a lot of opportunity here through your personal essays. The goal here is really to get to know you. There's the Common App essay. You choose from one of seven prompts. And the idea is that you should share something insightful about yourself that we couldn't have learned or maybe you couldn't have gone as deep into in another part of the application. That's really what we're looking for. Then in addition to the Common App essay, each university for the most part has their own university questions. And that's your chance to share anything relevant to the admissions process you think we should know as long as you answer the question, answer the question we've thought about and we've put out there because we really care about your answers to our questions. Um, the next part of the factors is the recommendation letters from a counselor and teachers. The key thing is it's the teacher who knows you best. And depending on a university you apply to, there may be some consideration for the subject matter that your the specific teacher is coming from. But in most cases, we just want to see a letter from a teacher who knows you, can shed some light on your experiences, your ability in the classroom, and maybe your contributions to the school community. And then the final piece that has become optional at most universities, but some still require it, is the standardized testing, the SAT or the ACT. Um, it, optional has many different meanings. So this is a great question to ask college universities at a fair, at an info session. What does test optional mean for us? Um, and the one thing I will say about standardized testing, do not get nervous about the middle 50% ranges you see published because that no longer represents all admitted students. It only represents that percentage that applied with the testing, which usually is half or under. And so who's going to be the student who submits a test score? The students who do really well on that optional factor. And so it inflates the mid 50% range and it can cause some anxiety. But you know, if you're not in that range, you have the option to not submit it and you will, be, you will not be disadvantaged in the process at most colleges or universities. So those are the big factors of admission that we consider, most universities will consider in one way or another, um, but looking forward to the questions later, thanks. Thank you, Mike. And we'll turn it over to Candace to talk a little bit about the role of the parent in the admissions process. And good evening to everybody. And uh, thank you, Karen and Mike, for getting the, the ball rolling. And um, yes, I am the parent of a current sophomore in college. So I have been there and done that. And I am also the parent of a current junior. So I am still there and doing that. So it's certainly a pleasure to um, to uh, address all of you and sort of going through the thick of it and um, having two kids who are you know very different. Um, I think it's important that fit and understanding your child. And uh, Karen, I so appreciate about having those conversations early and often. Those work with one child, the other one, we're letting them take the lead and yes I do get excited when my 11th grader brings up a topic and I let her take the lead on that but I'm maybe in the spring we'll start to doing a little bit more often and uh, <laughs> as it goes um, <clears throat> as parents uh, you know our number one priority is we want to protect our you know our children we want to safeguard them you know for, from you know from being hurt and disappointed. And that means we're probably sometimes a little bit, maybe too over involved in their life, including the college search and application process. And it's important to 
try to step back from this because, you know, life is tough and they're going to have to learn from, you know, disappointment. Um, and, and if they don't start to learn these consequences early, it, it could be a disservice for them um, going forward and not just in college, but later on, you know, applying for jobs or other experiences. So ultimately, we are there to guide and consult uh, with them, provide them feedback. We're not their personal assistant. Um, we are not their ghostwriter for their essays, but we're there to help guide them. And and um, and and I what I can say is, you know, a lot of what Karen said, and I know we'll probably talk a little bit more later on uh, with the questions. But we did have those open conversations. What are you looking for? Where do you see yourself thriving? Because in the end, that is what is best for our children, you know? So as, as we guide them, we want to make sure that wherever they're going to go, they're going to be respected. They're going to be challenged. Certainly, you know, not have anything go over their head and they're just way, um, you know, too deep into, you know, they, they can't handle the work, you know, and as Mike said, we want to make sure that they're also successful. Um, and so we want to make sure that, that students are going to be reaching their, their potential. So those conversations starting, yes, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, what sort of environment do you want to be in? And respecting because it's their experience. We already did college 20, 25, 30 years ago. And college's experience is very different. Um, so we want to make sure that we listen to what their interests are. And they may not know. As, as Karen says, you know, those lists are going to change. What you're interested in today is going to be different than tomorrow. And that's okay. We certainly understand. And that's what college is all about anyway. So listen to your students. Let them, you know, be, you know, if, if they say they want to go far away, that's okay. You know, explore and visit far away just so that they get that feel for, oh, this is what it is to take a plane ride and go four hours across country or you know, five hours on a, on a car ride, or actually maybe this is, it might be close, but it doesn't feel that close. So where do they see themselves as being um, successful? Um, also um, being setting, set, um, setting boundaries. So yes, you might wanna talk about it all the time. Your time every night is not the right place or time to do it. As you go deeper in the process, you know, maybe a weekly check-in, maybe senior year a little bit more often, but just not all the time. It could be very overwhelming for, for the students, especially if they're confused as to where they want to go, what they want to study, and all sorts of things happening from um, all around. And um, I think very, very important as part of the open and honest conversations is that financial conversation. You don't want to have that conversation in March or April where they have these wonderful admits to these schools. And it's like, oh, we didn't get the scholarship we thought, you know, it's too expensive. So, you know, they don't necessarily need to know everything, but at least try to be realistic as to, okay, how much can we afford each year? Um, don't wait till the last minute, but also don't discount a school just based on, on their sticker price. And um, I will just wrap it up by saying that, um, obviously, I, I, my child doesn't go to, to yours, to, to Greenwich, but my experience with, with my son two, um, two years ago as a senior, I remember going to meet with his school counselor mid to late September. We had a great conversation. List had been narrowed down and all this based on where we had visited school, types of schools he was interested in. School counselor said, oh, you know what? Um, you should, uh, Villanova, this is where he ended up going, his choice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Villanova's gonna be here, you should go to their presentation. And he said, no, that's okay. I was just there at a program. I did not go to the program with him. He went with his dad. And she said, well, you never know. The person who's presenting might be the one who reads your application. And then he disclosed, well, my mom works there. 
the school counselor then said, oh, I wish I would have known. We would have had such a different conversation. I said to the school counselor, I didn't want different. I wanted to be a regular parent. And the information, what we talked about, I so appreciate because it's exactly what we at the college side also tell the students. So you have an amazing resource. Let your students take ownership, meet with their school counselors, reach out to the schools. You have great resources uh, for schools. So you gotta let go a little bit but continue to guide and support our students. Thank you, Candace. And just along those lines for the sophomores and juniors that are in the audience, uh, you will be having your initial college meeting with your counselor um, in uh, December, January. You can start scheduling those in junior year. And that's an hour long meeting with your parents, student, counselor, and that's really where the list is you know, beginning to get developed. And then there's many more conversations after that, um, but you can stay tuned for that uh, starting in December in uh, junior year. Um, okay, so we have a lot of different questions. Um, I find the more time we spend on Q&A, the better, um, just to have more of a conversation. Uh, we definitely had some questions come in in advance and I'd like to organize it a little bit in terms of um, category. There were a number of questions around developing the college list. So I think just, you know, from your conversation, Candace, I think we can piggyback off that. Um, one of the questions is, as a parent, I often get asked, is this a good college? I have two kids of my own and I get asked that all the time. Uh, what makes a college good? Uh, and are rankings helping helpful for families to use when developing a college list? Really, what makes a college good? Anybody want to take that? I can start us off if that if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I will say oftentimes when we're speaking with families and students about our own institutions, there are wonderful conversations that we have. And then there's conversations where we say, you know what, I think you would be a great fit at a different type of institution. Maybe it's a major that they're really excited about. Maybe it's that they're looking for a larger institution. Maybe it's that they want to stay a little bit closer to home and home isn't in North Carolina, right? And so as we're thinking about drafting these lists, oftentimes students rely on word of mouth, conversations that they're having with peers, familiar institutions. Um, we can have a great conversation about rankings. They're part of the process. Um, are they the only part of the process? I think each student and each family will have to make a decision as to whether um, they're going to utilize one or multiple factors in helping to craft their list. And I hope that everyone walks away today with the idea and, and with the um, with the experience that every student is going to be different in this process. And so what applies to one child, if you have multiple children, um, may not apply to the second, third, or, or fourth child, and that's okay, right? And so if you're, as you're crafting a list, and I think about this because I have three children, twins that are 10, Mike, will reminisce um, together when we're going through the process, but also a 14-year-old. And I can tell you right now, they are all so different. And I, I already see how the process is going to be very different for each of them and that's okay, right? And so embracing that part of the process. I think ultimately as you're crafting a list, you should allow the student voice to help lead that conversation, help to infuse it as a parent, right? And help them um, talk through some of their some of their thought processes, right? When they're on a campus tour, how did you feel? Um, are they selecting an institution because there's a Chick-fil-A on campus? Or are they selecting an institution on their list because they have a really great football team? Or is that institution on their list because they think they're going to receive a merit scholarship? Or is that institution um, a, a, an institution that really aligns with some of the club sports and organizations that they've been a part of throughout their four year journey? And so, um, and, and this is why I go back to that list will change and that's okay because where you start at the beginning may be a little bit different towards the end. I always encourage families to have one or two um, reach institutions or aspirant institutions where we think, you know what, we really want to go all in um, and have one or two where we think um, we're going to have 
a good chance of getting in. And then it's that mid range level of institutions, right? Where do we think not only can we get in, but if we get in, we're going to be really excited about as opposed to over, um, um, you know, thinking about this process and having maybe too many reach schools or undermatching and not um, not selecting institutions that maybe could be a better academic social environment for them in the long run. Candace, I interrupted you at first. My apologies. No, that, that's fine. Thank you, Karen. And, and I think it's also important to know that what, you know, is, is a best school it's not, it's not the same, you know, for your neighbor, for your classmate, for your cousin, it's what's best for you, you know, not the decal on the back of a car, but as I said earlier, what is best for the students, where they're going to be successful, where they're going to thrive, where they're going to um, be respected as, as individuals. So best is, you know, to Karen's point, each child is going to be different. Best is for each student differently um, and um, different factors. Mike, I don't know if there's anything else to add. Great, thank you, that was very helpful. Um, okay, another question kind of around uh, list development is what is the difference between early action and early decision and pros and cons of each? Happy to jump in on this one. So this is the fun of admissions terminology. Um, so early decision is the easiest way to think about this is early action is where you apply to a university and you get a decision earlier in the process and you have until May 1 to say yes or no to that offer of admission. So you just get the decision earlier and you can engage with the university as an admitted student for a longer period of time than just say April, which is traditionally how it may work with regular decision. Um, early decision is you have explored all of the colleges that you're looking at, and there is one that just in your mind is the place you want to be. And if you identify one college university where you're like, this is really leading my interest. Oh, and they have early decision. That's a chance for me to apply. And by applying early decision, I'm saying, if you admit me, I will enroll. And so the worst approach would be to enter this and go, I know I want to apply early decisions somewhere, I just don't know where, because that means you're not approaching this in the right mindset. If there isn't really one university that stands out, one place, but there are a few that are really high on your list, then it's best to consider, do they have early action? What's regular decision look like? Um, but that's the biggest difference between early decision and early action. One is a binding agreement, that you've on the front end said you'll enroll and early, that's early decision. And early action is you get the decision earlier, but you still have plenty of time to say yes or no to that offer. Thank you, Mike, that was great. Um, another question is uh, again around uh, the college list is when is a good time to start discussing the cost of college as a family? Um, many of us may not qualify for financial aid, but we may need to look at colleges with merit scholarships. So how do you find schools with merit scholarships? I think just an overall conversation around cost and, and merit money specifically. I, um, I would say probably towards the end of junior year to beginning of senior year. Um, and you know maybe that's part of the conversations as as you, you know, meeting with your students going forward um, in their junior year later on uh, in the winter, that, you know, those are factors, what are the interests that the students have, and then be able to go back to the parents and say, hey, you know, great conversations, I'm interested, you know, bigger, smaller majors, this, that. Okay, so let's, you know, hopefully the parents have an idea how much, you know, they have to either put away, what they can afford, and to be able to start to look at some of those schools. Um, keep in mind that schools do different things with their scholarships and financial aid. Not all schools offer merit-based scholarships. Some schools might put uh, the majority of their funding toward need-based aid. There are some schools that might require um, different applications to be considered for merit scholarships. So, 
not all schools uh, will do the the same kind of uh, financial aid for each for each student. So, as you're visiting schools and trying to find, you know, where might be a good place to go, we have all that information on the website. We're not hiding it. So check out the website and reach out to us. Ask specific information. You know, what percent of financial aid is uh, is met if there is need? Um, you know, how much? Um, what what percentage of students get financial aid? What percentage of students, you know, apply for financial aid that don't get it? So I, I would say definitely before you start the application process, but as you start to narrow down your list of schools to, to apply. That's really great advice, Candace. And I'll simply add that there's a tool that all colleges and universities offer on their website. Um, and so you can check out the net price calculator um, for each institution. And some will have built in scholarship methodology into their net price calculator. And so you can begin to see, right, based upon your family income, based upon a child's academic progress in high school, what potentially you might receive in terms of financial aid and or scholarship offer. And then you can always follow up with an institution and say, we utilize the net price calculator. This is around about what it's shared. Can you um, tell us a little bit more if I have two in college. Um, what if my financial income was different from one year to the next because we utilize what's called prior prior tax information for the financial aid need based scholarship uh, process at many institutions. Um, and then also recognizing that there are a multitude of forms out there and the FAFSA is utilized for government funds right so when we think about um, work study, loans, Pell Grants, SEOG, et cetera, versus what institutions might utilize um, a CSS profile or an internal application for institutional and or scholarship aid from, um, from each place. So keep that in mind. And certainly that net price calculator is a really great starting point as you're having the conversation. And, and I want to emphasize that it is important to have the conversation because as Candace mentioned, there's no greater level of defeat when you have all these offers of admission and you just want to celebrate, but then you have to break the news to your child that I think it's great, but we this is what we can afford and the, the financial aid or scholarships that you have um, maybe haven't met that. And so how do you navigate that, the complexity of that conversation? So um, good luck with all. I know it's, it, it's a really tough process, but if you're having the conversation um, and you're being open and transparent with one another as you need to, um, I think that will be a pivotal part to the process for you all. Thanks, Karen. And just to add to that, that's definitely something that should come up in the college meeting with your school counselor. Um, and we're really fortunate to have a program at Greenwich High School called College Kickstart, which uh, juniors will be invited to uh, College Kickstart in January. Uh, current seniors have access, but it's really a great way to uh, see all your colleges on your list with accurate um, information on average um, merit scholarships offered from each school, uh, percentage of financial aid that's met. Um, but it's really a great resource for students that are, you know, factoring in cost. Um, but that will be available second semester uh, junior year. Okay, let's just let's talk a little bit about we've had some uh, some changes uh, happening in admissions over the last few years. Um, uh, one question that came up several times is uh, how are colleges handling the recent Supreme Court ruling eliminating affirmative action and how do you expect this will impact our students? I'm happy to kick this off. I think that like any of the, the growing external influences on admissions, it's just a lot of us in the profession have had to really stop and think how do we adhere to the law? How do we follow exactly what the guidance is? but also how do we achieve our mission and goals? Um, you know, we are committed to ensuring that our universities and all three of us here and many universities across the country are committed to ensuring that we are opening doors to our institutions. We're committed to access. We want students from a wide variety of backgrounds and experiences. And the good news is there's a number of different ways for students to talk about who they are, um, what matters to them, um, how to highlight different elements of their identity and background that are extremely relevant to their story um, through many parts of the application. 
I think one thing that most of you probably have noticed is that if you look at a lot of the specific questions on applications, they reflect those values and that interest in learning about a student's background and experiences, and especially if it's something that has influenced them or defined them as a person. And the Supreme Court ruling specifically gives colleges and universities the, the legal route to ensure that we can consider that. Um, so it's beyond checking a box, it's understanding the student in their context. And one thing I think a lot of us are doing in admissions is ensuring that those who review applications um, and make decisions are trained to really understand nuance and context and perspective that students, their letter writers and others share. And at the end of the day, really ensuring that the more we have a pipeline from every type of school, every type of community, every part of the US and around the world, that when we go into the application process and review applications with some blinders on, not knowing everything we'd like to know, but with some blinders on, that because we have such a diverse pool that represents students of every background and walk of life, that when we ultimately select students based on the criteria we do have available, we'll actually have an admitted group of students that reflects everything that we're looking for in our pool. That takes work, it takes effort, it takes time. Um, we have our staff really, I think all of us and many other universities are spending a lot of time and effort in high schools and communities and places across the country and worldwide to ensure that we're um, letting students from every background know that they, if they you know, apply, and go through our process that they have an opportunity to enroll at our institutions and we believe they belong there. Um, so I think it's really just helped us think about how do we frame things, how do we talk about things, where are we present, how are we active, because at the end of the day, our communities value this, graduate schools and professional schools value this, employers value this, as many of you may know from your companies and organizations, we want to ensure we're setting our students up for success and setting them up for um, success in the world that we live in. And so that's been a big part of our effort over the past few months and honestly, the past few years preparing for this possibility. And I think I have a lot of faith in my colleagues, not only here tonight, but across the nation. I think it's a very different environment than when the first case was introduced in the 1970s. And luckily the students from every background and walk of life who are on our college campuses now have earned the spot there they are an incredible benefit to the campus community. And that's something that won't change whether or not we have a box that they can check on the application. Very helpful. And along those lines, Mike, uh, we noticed as counselors that many institutions added a new supplemental essay centered around diversity over the summer um, to give students an opportunity to talk about their diverse backgrounds. Um, as counselors, uh, we often have students uh, that come to us that are not from diverse backgrounds and really struggle with that supplemental essay topic. I know we have some seniors here tonight. Just wonder if you can comment uh, briefly on how to approach that question again if you're not from a diverse background. Did you want me to answer that or I'm oh, happy really, to anybody, anybody. Yeah, yeah, this, well, just wanted to make sure that was clear. <laughs> So anybody could take that. I really don't know how to um, you know, answer that question as we've always had in our supplements in addition to the common app question, we've had options for students. And as part of our mission, we've always had some type of question where students can address, you know, their backgrounds, you know, who they are. So you know, it, it, it's always been available for students as one of our different prompts. So I don't know, you know, Wake Forest, I don't know, Karen, I don't know if you're one who recently added that question that didn't have it. Um, I, I don't want to put will you say, on the spot. Yeah, no, I, I love being put on the spot. I will say that Wake Forest has uh, is unapologetic for how robust of an application, along with supplemental questions uh, we've had in the past and continue to have in current day. Um, I will say that institutions are not wavering in their commitment to build community. And based upon our mission and values and our mottos and who we are and who we hope to be moving forward, 
I think if anything, the, the SCOTUS decision and changes that we're seeing happening across the nation, it's really allowed us to hone in on some of the mission driven pieces that um, we care about most. And if diversity is one of those and you're seeing an institution that has a new prompt this year that focuses around diversity, take a moment to reflect on that and think about what diversity means to you. You're at a school with 2,700 plus high school students from a rich, diverse background in, in Greenwich, Connecticut. You have a, a very well-rounded community. You're super close to places like New York and Boston, right? And thinking about how global of an experience um, you have right in your own backyard, right? Um, think about the opportunities that you've been afforded think about the experiences that you have. I often hear from students who say, I'm looking for that adversity to highlight. I'm looking for that component that will help me stand out from my peers. And I, and I have to emphasize that it, there's only one you in this process and how you choose to convey your best self through the experiences and opportunities that you've had, I think that will go a long way and how you view diversity and how you view community and how you view your commitment to others. Um, I think that's extremely important because again, we're looking to build campus communities. Um, you're going to live with your peers. You're going to be in our residence halls. You're going to frolic across campus uh, in clubs and organizations and sports and theater and, and all these other opportunities. Um, don't allow maybe the what you perceive the question or prompt to be um, to to limit you right, especially if it's not an experience, a lived experience that you've had in that moment. Um, so own that, and and I always say have a little bit of fun in the process. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, so we have definitely a lot of questions around standardized testing. So I know um, we touched upon that briefly, but I think one of the questions that has come up a few times is uh, from our Greenwich community where many of our students have access to test prep. Um, I think there is a lot of, you know, just anxiety around if I don't have scores within that median range, really, is that going to hurt me coming from the Greenwich community? I'm happy to kick us off here and say no, it does not, because we are we we know and we train our readers to not make assumptions. We there's a lot to stories that we don't know, and if that information isn't there, we're not going to assume that there's a reason why it's. We know there's a reason why it's not there, but we don't know what, and we're not going to go down that path because that's a really slippery slope for every other part of an applicant. And so even if you're in a community that has a lot of access to standardized testing and test prep, if there's no test score there, I wish we had the luxury to sit and contemplate why that's not there, but we don't have the time. We have required factors and we focus on those. And if you don't submit standardized testing, we've moved on, it's optional. We're good with it being optional. It's just like if you didn't submit an optional letter of recommendation, we don't sit there going, why wouldn't, why didn't they do that? What's wrong? We don't, we don't go at the negative. We try and go from the reason as to what in this application gives us the chance to advocate for admission. We don't operate from kind of the reasons to deny. And so really, I would not overthink this too much because there are a whole host of reasons why you might not submit a standardized test score. Um, and we just aren't going to get into them. And to add, oh, go ahead. I was, I was just going to add, sorry, Allison, that we have actually heard from students say, you know what, I got a 1480 and I want to be admitted and considered under my own academic merit and my extracurricular activities, not in a test score. And, but once again, so, hey, you chose not to submit, that's totally fine. Oh, sorry, just, just to add a little more that you can't assume that all test scores are not good. And, and, and Mike, maybe you can piggyback off this. Um, you had mentioned that test optional can mean different things at different schools. So how as a parent and, and student, how do we figure out where does it really matter? 
Yeah, I'd say one place that you can really get a sense of this is through the Common App, because on the Common App member section, a lot of times we'll have little boxes that say, like, if you'd like the test score to be considered, if you submit it, we will look at it. It will be a factor. Other places may have a disclaimer there or on their website, or you could email the, the admissions officer responsible for Connecticut or your area and ask them to say, if I, you know, how is testing utilized in your process? What percent of admitted students had a test score? What percent of applicants had a test score? If that's not apparent on the site. So I think knowing how they use it, I will say in most cases, it seems like if you submit a test score, in most cases, a university will look at it if you say you want it to be looked at. And then that's where it gets a little risky is if we look at it, it's all about you chose to submit it. And so where are you in that range? We've kind of told you with the mid 50% where 50% fell and 25% were above that and 25% were below that. And so just like Candace was saying, this notion of prior to test optional, a sc some scores were incredible. But because only a certain subset submitting them, now our mid 50% range can be so high that if you have below a certain score and you submit it, you could be putting yourself at a bit of a disadvantage because of the rest of the pool that chose to submit. So I think it's getting that information. If it's not on the web page, if it's not in the brochure, email your admissions rep, go to an info session and ask that question. The rest of the audience will thank you for asking that question. Um, I think it's just getting some of those facts to hear what's the range, what percent submits. So you can kind of start to go, okay, at this institution, you know, 60% submitted a test score and I'm within the range. Maybe that's a good place to submit. But at this institution, less than a third submitted a test score, I'm outside the range. Maybe that's not a good place to submit. There's a little bit of strategy here and utilize your counseling to parents and students. They can help you maneuver that data, that information, um, and, and get, get a good idea of what you want to do for different institutions. And actually, just to add to that, we have our annual college fair coming up next Thursday night uh, where we have roughly 150 colleges that will be there. And that's a perfect question to ask an admissions counselor behind the table is about testing. Do you require it? What is your range? Do you really consider it? But that's a perfect opportunity to ask some of those questions. Let's see what Allison, else we can have. Can I, yeah. can I add we, one, one tiny little thing and simply mm -hmm. encourage folks as you're thinking about this process, ask the institutions what admissions um, uh, philosophy they practice, right? So holistic admissions is something that we practice at Wake Forest, but I know that there are some institutions that with a GPA and an SAT score, this is where you would fit in in terms of particular major program. And so think about the admissions philosophy of each institution and that Excel sheet that I talked about at the beginning, right? You're adding in all these columns of all these different factors so that you can better understand this institution is looking heavily at SAT or ACT test scores. This institution is practicing holistic admissions. This other institution is practicing a combination of these um, so that you're making a well-informed decision in the process and not feeling um, like all, you know, it's a one size fits all and that every institution is going to practice the same. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to, to work with Candace and, and now with Mike and our institutions are completely different. Um, and yet that's the fun part about being able to host panels like this is that, um, you know, we get to share a little bit more about those differences and the nuance in our process. And that's what is important to students to better understand how to engage with us and how to identify what's going to be a good fit for them. Yeah, thanks, Karen. I, and I feel like one of the positive things that came out of the pandemic are the virtual offerings that colleges have. And so, you know, it's wonderful to have these live panels, um, but I will say it's really impressive to see all of the virtual webinar, I mean, all different info sessions, student panels that are very easily accessible on college websites. And some of them are focused specifically on essay writing, some some focus specifically on interview skills, some on testing. Um, but it's a great way to really start researching is, is taking advantage of all those virtual opportunities. 
And then once once you've done some research and some you know work virtually, um, there's definitely some questions about how important is it to to get on campus in person. If anybody wants to take that, sure. Um, it's really for the benefit of the student. Once again, it goes back to that list about fit and feel. And we certainly recognize that not every student is gonna be able to make it to, um, to visit every school. So try to fi figure out, am I able to you know, visit in the summertime? It's not gonna be the same. You're not gonna have as many students. You know? um, do I have days off during the school year that I'm allowed to go visit school when they're in session to get that feel? So it's really more for you to have that feel of the school, um, keeping in mind that there are some schools that track demonstrated interest. So important to know, is it important for me to visit the school because it will play a role in the possible admission decision. Not all schools track demonstrated interest. Uh, from a personal perspective, we had our list of schools we, we visited from Ohio all across Pennsylvania. There were some schools that we weren't able to visit, but visiting the school and, and the tour did make it or break it for, um, for my son deciding to apply or not to apply to some of the institutions. And so it is helpful when you're able to do it if you're not able to get out to visit those schools and, and talk with students or sit in on classes. To your point, Allison, you know, there's virtual tours that might be available to give students a, um, an opportunity to get a feel for the institution. You might, you know, if it's a farther away school, you might want to wait until you're admitted before you visit, if, especially if they're a little bit farther away. So if you're able to do it, you know, go for it. Um, we love it when students come to visit our campus. We feel that that's a big selling point, but at the same time, we understand that not everybody, you know, because as with, I'm sure, you know, Vanderbilt and Wake Forest, you know, you have students who apply from all across the country and around the world and not everybody's able to make it, um, but it's really for their benefit, so. Thank you, Candace. I have a parent, it looks like of a senior who has a great question. Um, so students are spending many hours pulling together their applications, often agonizing over essay word choices. Was this sentence sound better than this sentence. Um, but I've heard, not surprisingly, that admission teams only spend a few minutes reviewing each application. And maybe kids are over-investing in their applications, not having this context. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you review applications and, you know, comment on that. One thing I would just say from kind of the, the over agonizing piece of it is to really, the, the goal here is, I hear the word unique used a lot, and I think that's kind of a misplaced word choice when it comes to college admissions. You're all high school students. You're a few hundred of you know millions across the US. If you try and make, kind of go into this being unique, that's gonna, that's a lot on you. It's a lot on your, on parents, it's a lot on the students, it's a lot on everyone in the process. But I think if you go into this thinking about how do I tell my story? How do I convey who I am? How am I being personal and insightful in my answers? And then you carry that forward and say, if I write something, who do I have review that? Who's been my cheerleader? Who's the person who will keep me from being too humble? I think too often everyone gets caught up in, you know, I need to have every piece of punctuation correct. It's a competitive process. So there's a lot of assumption that it's like, we want to read the best thing we've ever written. Nope, already have done that from experts who have written you know, over decades of their lives. I'm not looking for that in your essay or in your answers. I'm not looking that, for that from a letter writer. I'm looking to learn about you and to get to know you. And so as long as you do that and demonstrate to us that you've proofread and you've done your due diligence there, I would let the rest of the stress drift away because I think Karen and Candace might, might acknowledge this, but I think some of the best essays I've written are the ones that aren't the best written thing I've ever read, but it's the content. 
It's what I learned, the insight I gained, the, the, the added depth to the story of that person. And sometimes it's not anything earth shattering. It's not something they've overcome. It's a lens into them, how something influenced them, impacted them. And I have a feeling that student probably had a much better process because they weren't riddled with anxiety and stress about it, but they talked about what they wanted to talk about and who they were. So find the right pieces, find the right people to be involved, and it should hopefully take some of that away. And those are the students we're admitting, folks. Like we're not, we're not saying that and then denying all of those students. Those are the ones who are getting admitted, who have that piece along with all the other pieces. Mm. And I want to add to that, sorry, Karen, you know, just the question, you know, how, how are applications reviewed? That's going to be very different from institution to institution. Um, sorry, Karen, I, I think you were maybe going to go that way. Um, you know, depending on, I think we've sort of touched on this subject, you know, what is it that the institution values? So we've sort of addressed a little bit, you know, you know, will, will some institutions fo focus more, you know, just, you know, not just, but, you know, focus more on the academics, you know, the curriculum. Mike talked a lot about earlier, you know, like reviewing you in the context of your opportunity and experiences. So there's a lot of different factors that, you know, we're going to consider um, for students. So it's, it's not just going to be the essay. It's not just going to be the activities or the recommendation, but to Karen, what she was saying earlier, that holistic point a, a view that many different factors um, that we take into consideration uh, and what, you know, are we looking for in crafting our class with different points of views and perspectives also. Karen. It was like we were reading each other's minds there. I was simply going to say that every institution is going to be so different in this process. It is not a one size fits all. And so ask these questions and make sure that you're better understanding what we value as part of our process. I can say in our office, an application can go through multiple review experiences. The first person to prepare the application will spend quite a bit of time getting to know not just the student, but also the high school, right? So what are the changes at Greenwich? What are, what are students involved in? What are some of the academic tracks that are available? And then preparing the application, meaning working throughout all the application pieces to best represent the student as they move along in the process. I often will hear folks talk about us in, in these roles as gatekeepers. Um, and I actually push back on that term and I, and I recognize that I sit in a position of privilege, but I'm often the one helping students move along in the process and not keeping them out, right? And so it's your responsibility, student and parents, right? To make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, you're having these conversations, you're allowing the student voice to be heard, right? The, the authentic voice, right? We know the difference between a 16 and 17 year old versus, you know, a 30 or 40 year old um, and, and the word choices and just the delivery, they're so different, right? Um, and so think about how you're choosing to engage in this process and appreciate that we're taking the time to get to know you and we're courting you in the same way that you're courting us. And if you're hearing about a review process that maybe doesn't align and doesn't allow you to be an individual throughout this process, then is that the right place? Is that the right institution for you to be applying to? Or maybe you're really excited about that and it doesn't matter that that's part of their review process, right? Um, that they're just looking at maybe, for example, just the SAT scores um, or just an, a GPA or just looking for a particular curriculum. And so it's important to do your due diligence, know that every institution is going to be different um, and most importantly, making those decisions that are going to be the best in the long term for your child throughout this process. Thank you, Karen. It looks like we have a, maybe just one more uh, question uh, before we have to close tonight. Um, I think we, we can just look ahead to our college fair next Thursday night. Again, we have a lot of colleges. Students can have great opportunity to ask questions. Just in your experience, you know, standing behind a table, which you've all done uh, many times before, like what are some of the qu best questions and how do you feel like students can really take advantage of, of a college fair? Um, please, please, for, this is for the students, you know, and the students, you know, hopefully you are the ones approaching us 
Um, and certainly, you know, parents want to listen to the answers. I might need to coax the students, but you know, let's start giving a little bit individualized. You know, if, if you have an idea, you know, what you're interested in studying, go ahead and ask, you know, tell me about your business program, your psychology program. Don't ask me if it's good because I'm going to tell you it's good unless I don't have that program. So, you know, ask informed questions, you know, tell me about your you know, specific program. If you're undecided, maybe a good question would be, how do students, you know, get guided and supported in choosing a major? If you're interested in particular activities, you know, find out, you know, do you have a particular club? How easy is it to become involved? So don't be afraid. You know, we have been doing this for a long time. Um, we're there to help you and provide the information. And, and like Karen says, you know, sometimes if we don't have a particular program, we're more than happy to guide and say, oh, you know what? We don't, but Vanderbilt does or Wake Forest. Hey, we're all at the end of the alphabet. We've been traveling together. <laughs> so, you know, we can certainly guide people um, to different, you know, to different institutions. So don't be afraid to ask questions. But yes, our programs are all going to be good unless we don't have. That's such great advice, Candace. Um, I will add that if you can find the answer on our website, if you can quickly search it and you can find it on our website, then that's a question you don't want to ask, right? And so think about what's important to you. Think about who you are. Is it campus culture? Is it opportunities for engagement on campus, off campus? Is it research? Is it um, a particular topic that you want to address? Is it having a conversation with faculty? How accessible are they? Um, what, what are the opportunities for access to different resources? Those are the types of questions that get us most excited because we get to talk to you about personal experiences, about experiences of our students in the in most recent months as they've arrived on our campuses. And we get to really shine, right? And, and get excited about the things that matter to students in that moment. If you're asking us, do you offer a really great bio program? None of us will say it's, it's a horrible program. Don't come to our institution, right? We're all going to say wonderful things because we have such great programs. Um, and I will say that no institution out there is a bad institution, right? And so when you're going through this process, asking the right questions, making sure you understand who we are as institutions, what we value, take a look at our mission statements, take a look at what um, you know, it is, is, you know, in the student newspaper, I often will recommend students, hey, check out, you know, what our students are writing about, what's a hot topic, what's trending on campus. Um, and that way they can get a better sense in terms of who we are as a campus community. And the final thing I'll do is one, reiterate everything Candace and Karen said, those would be the types of questions we'd want to answer at a college fair, and I think provide the most value to a family but do a little bit of that homework in advance. You know the names of the schools and colleges that will be there. And so getting some of that baseline information out of the way so you know what you wanna ask a large public flagship versus a medium-sized university versus a liberal arts, East Coast versus West Coast. And it just, you might have some different questions that get beyond the webpage because things you'll get facts on the webpage but I have yet to meet a college website that doesn't present the college in the best light. It's the best pictures, it's the best ways to look at it. So if you wanna dig a little into that, those are the types of questions to ask, such as, I see that a majority of your students complete internships or do research. Can you share some examples of what a, bio a biology or science-based major would have as an internship or possibly research opportunities? kind of digging a little deeper. So your question isn't, do you have internships here? But it's digging beyond that. That's where you'll get the value added that sometimes can be hard to find on the webpage. I'd just like to close by, so I always tell students, find a couple hidden gems on a college night. Um, many of your institutions, institutions like yourselves will have hundreds of students lined up and a student may be standing there for a half an hour and only get to two schools. And then there are other tables that may not have anybody or just have a couple of students. It doesn't mean that those schools aren't as good as, um, as your institutions, but um, challenge yourself, find a couple of those hidden gems on, on college night. The, college, uh, the list of colleges that are confirmed are on our website. 
bring the list to your counselor and say, can you highlight a few hidden gems? I'm going to find a couple hidden gems for me uh, to talk to on college night. But I can't thank all of you enough. I'm going to um, get you all on your way uh, for your evening. It's a Monday night. I greatly, greatly appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to be with us. Uh, for families that are in the audience, again, we have college night next Thursday. We have a junior college kickoff meeting in December, and then we'll have other panels like this in the spring. So there's, you know, we didn't get to all the questions, but there'll be plenty of opportunities to get all these questions answered uh, throughout the year. And as counselors, we're always uh, here to answer any individual questions as well. Uh, so thank you all. Have a fabulous evening and uh, look forward to um, seeing you probably later in the fall. All right. Good night.